Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In January 1604, King James convened the Hampton Court Conference, where a new English version of the Bible was conceived in response to the problems of the earlier translations perceived by the Puritans, an orthodox faction of the Church of England. One cannot underestimate the spiritual, cultural, political, and literary importance and influence of the authorized version's preeminence in the English-speaking world, including vast parts of North America. We tell the story of the publication of the King James Version of the Bible, the most widely published book in the English language. It's been called our national epic, the noblest monument of English prose and rivaled only by Shakespeare for the beauty and the influence of its language. James Naughty tells the story of the King James Bible, from its origins in a royal conference, through the arduous work of a committee of scholars, to its spread around the world through the empire and the missionary movement. We tell the story of the King James Bible with the Commission. The story of the King James Bible continues now. What do we know about what was discussed, what the topics were, at the Hampton Court Conference, and what wasn't spoken of? On the first day... Only the bishops were allowed in. James told the Puritans to come back later. And if you look at the official record, it seems like it was all very friendly. If you look at some of the other sources, though, you can see James giving the bishops a bit of a kicking. He suggested to them that he would only change what was necessary. But then the less official sources do suggest that he did want some changes. On the second day, he did let the Puritans come in. And he started to ask them, well, what date you like then? What are your objections? And it was quite a rumbustious atmosphere. We know that, don't we? Oh, certainly. You won't find it in the official account, but some of the others describe the coarseness, the crudity of James's language. At one point he says, I give a turd for your argument to the Puritans, for example. And he's treating the thing as a little bit of a joke. He says, oh, we've had such a revel with the Puritans these last two days. I have peppered them as soundly as ye have done the Papists. They fled me so from argument to argument, without ever answering me directly, that if any of them had been in a college disputing with their scholars, if any of their disciples had answered them in that sort, they would have fetched him up in place of a reply, and so should the rod have played upon the poor boy's buttocks. And when was it that the new translation began to be spoken of in this place? The Puritans discovered that things are not going very well, the Puritans begins to raise the issue of Bibles that are allowed to be read in church. And clearly, the Bishop's Bible is something that the Puritans finds difficult. And as far as we can see, the Puritans really wants to be allowed to use one particular Bible, which the Puritans thinks really fits in well with the Puritan way of looking, namely the Geneva Bible of 1560. And really what the Puritan saying is, look, we want to be able to use another kind of Bible. James doesn't really like that particular Bible at all, but it seems that in saying no to what he thinks the Puritans has in mind, he opens the door to something else, which is a new translation of the Bible. So this might have been the moment where the new translation began to sit on the table in embryo, as it were. Yes, I think uh, almost accidentally. These are two parties making very delicate tactical moves, and it comes up as a response to a very real, live situation of needing to protect one's position. What a moment. It, it is indeed, and I have some sympathy for the Puritans in all of this, because in Scotland, when James had suggested a new translation, it seems likely that what he had in mind was a revision of the Geneva Bible. And indeed, a Geneva Bible had been dedicated to him and published in Scotland. And politically very interesting because it's an English Bible with a preface in Scots. So when this all comes up again, the Puritan was taken by surprise because the king's view has changed. What was it about the Geneva Bible that disturbed James? Well, it wasn't the translation. The translation was entirely consistent with his thinking, and he had been happy with the Geneva Bible in Scotland. The difficulty for him was the annotation, and his initial instinct was to have a Bible without any annotation at all. And indeed, when the Bible project finally worked its way out, that is precisely what happened. There were no marginal notes that were interpretative. And what was the problem with the marginal notes in the Geneva Bible? 
Well, there was one note in particular that was deemed to question the authority of the king. Ah. In the first chapter of Exodus, the pharaoh orders Jewish midwives to kill all male children. And they go along to the pharaoh afterwards and explain that they were unable to do this because the physiology of Jewish women is quite different, and they all give birth to babies just before the midwives arrive, so they were unable to kill them. And the Geneva note says that their dissembling was unlawful, but their disobedience of the king was lawful. And James thought there were no circumstances in which one could possibly disobey the king. How fascinating it is to think that the great artifact which emerged from this conference after seven years was one that was never a centerpiece of the discussion at all. Well, I'd say during the actual course of the conference, it wasn't the most momentous item under discussion because James kind of said, well, we'll set up a committee and they can get on with it. And it wasn't really discussed. And they spent the third day of the conference talking about other things, all these other little things that the Puritans were objecting to. And after three days, it drew to an end. What do we know about the climax to the conference? Well, all the storms were over. Everybody jointly promised to be quiet and obedient. And the king's final speech was so piercing, so touching, that it fetched tears from those on both sides. So what were the practical arrangements that were now made? Well, they were highly structured. It was decided to have six committees, which were called companies, three for the Old Testament, two for the New Testament, and then, most sensitive of all, a committee to deal with the Apocrypha. Two of the committees were to be in Oxford, two in Cambridge, and two in Westminster. And it's important to say Westminster rather than London, because Westminster Abbey was a royal peculiar, so the king had direct control over the committees. In all, there seemed to have been 54 translators, including revisers. The company that was assembled was the most learned men in the nation. And in the end, this process guaranteed a Bible that reflected the wishes of King James. Who drew up the rules for the translators? What sorts of things did they allow and prohibit? Well, I think two of them are really very interesting. One of them is that previous versions of the Bible, in fact, even going as far back to William Tyndall in the 1520s, are to be used. And really, they're only to be improved upon where the context demands it. I think you can see here James's real anxiety about continuity. No radical changes, but rather building on what is safe from the past. And secondly, they're very concerned indeed that the what he calls the traditional language shall be used. In other words, church, not congregation. Congregation is dangerous. That suggests you're talking about individual congregations. That sends out very dangerous signals. It's all about continuity, tradition. And baptize and not wash, or indeed bishop, which is perhaps the most sensitive of all, instead of elder or senior. What strikes me about the other rules is how immensely scrupulous they are, even if you compare it with scholarly editions that are being prepared now in the 21st century. What is striking is that there is a process of exchanging drafts of panels, constantly having their work subject to revision, and this is a process far more scrupulous than anything that had happened before, or indeed any translation that has been executed since then. So when the conference was over and all the delegates had gone, who was happy with what had happened? Well, several people were happy and several people were under the illusion of being happy. The king was certainly pleased with the outcome. He says at one point in a private letter that he peppered the Puritans. The Puritans were reasonably happy in that although they had lost most of their arguments about ceremony, they had gained a new translation of the Bible. It wasn't until later that they were to realize that the rules of the Bible were stacked against them. On January the 20th, 1604, James's conference came to an end, and we move away from Hampton Court. The translators took their leave of the king and went to their colleges and libraries to start work. The task would take them seven years, and the result of their labors would be a text that would leave indelible tracks across the centuries. For many Christians, the translation would be a cornerstone of their faith, and across the English-speaking world, it would remain for countless people of many faiths and none a literary masterpiece. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.